Um, our usual house rules, uh, all our CP, I mean, all our webinars are CPD accredited, including tonight's uh, webinar. Certificates take about a week to be ready. If you've got any queries regarding this, you can send them to cpd at discovery.co.za. Um, and all our webinars are made available on the Discovery website under the tab for healthcare professionals. Please ask your questions uh, in the Q&A section and uh, do understand that we do get inundated with a number of questions. And uh, because of the high volumes, uh, we try and theme them as best as possible so that we get our speakers to address them um, as much as possible. Tonight, we've got a very specific and special call at the end of this uh, webinar. Please uh, stay on and uh, give us your feedback on this poll. Uh, it will be uh, flighted at the end of the, of the, of the webinar. Tonight's webinar will be led by Prof. Ames Dai, who, is a very, who will be known to most of you on this call, followed by a very engaging discussion with the members of the Summer Human Rights Law and Ethics Committee. Prof. Ames Dai is a leading authority in bioethics. She is the founder and past director of the Steve Legal Center for Bioethics at the VETS Faculty of Health Sciences from 2007 to 2019. She's a specialist ethicist at the Office of the President and CEO of the South African Medical Research Council. She's editor-in-chief of the South African Journal of Bioethics and Law, and also she's an associate editor of the South African Medical Journal, as well as vice chair on the Ministerial Advisory Committee of COVID-19 Vaccines, amongst many other uh, prestigious titles that she holds. So we're really honored to have Prof here uh, presenting to us, and uh, I will introduce the rest of the panelists at the end of the, of the talk. Over to you, Prof. Good evening, Nolu, and good evening to the delegates attending. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Um, okay. Um, am I on... Um, Am I on, uh, can you see my, my uh, presentation? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Okay. And you can see it, okay. Yes. Okay, so uh, thank you so much to everyone for attending this session. And basically, I'm going to t walk us through how we will inform SAMA's position on vaccine mandates and vaccine certificates. So by way of outline, I'll bring in our context. I'll say something on ethical and legal principles. We look at what's happening in other countries uh, in terms of comparative law. And throughout, I'll be talking about balance, balancing individual rights, with, uh, with, with uh, collective benefits. So uh, on the 11th of June, uh, there was a directive issued by the Minister of Labor, which talked to bringing in mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations for certain workplaces. And soon after that, uh, we saw businesses taking up the guidance in those directives and, uh, and uh, moving forward in terms of instituting this mandatory COVID-19 vaccines in line with the guidance points, which I will talk to in a little while. And, uh, you know, and it's, it was not just any businesses, but it was businesses that really mattered. And this includes uh, Business Unity South Africa as well. And in parallel, what we saw was, well, South Africa is South Africa. And we saw all our demonstrations against the vaccines by those that lacked vaccine confidence, or alternatively were hesitant, but more specifically those that were out to, uh, to give anti-vaxxer messages. And we saw this in South Africa and we saw it in other parts of the world as well. 
And unfortunately, within our South African situation, we also had healthcare workers spreading the misinformation and feeding into the anti-vaxxer debate. So while this is raging on the 14th of September, a Durban High Court judge issued a directive that only people who had been vaccinated against COVID-19 or who could provide proof of a negative COVID-19 test result would be allowed to attend a court case that he was presiding over at that time. So despite the noises, we found the legal fraternity and the business fraternity moving ahead. So what are some of the ethical considerations then when we look at mandatory vaccinations? Uh, for this, I draw from African indigenous values of interdependence, interrelatedness, and mutually respectful discussion and debate. Uh, these were the values that we used when we drew up our COVID-19 vaccine strategy uh, in January this year uh, as, as part of the activities of the, uh, the vaccine map. And from these values, we were able to tease out four pivotal principles that we could apply to the vaccine strategy. And at that time, it was on allocation of vaccines, considering that the demand uh, outweighed the supply. However, these four principles can also be used when looking at how we can ethically justify uh, uh, taking forward COVID-19 mandates and having everyone that requires to be vaccinated, vaccinated. So bringing in the compulsion to vaccinate. And these four values, as you can see them on the screen, affirming the humanity of others. So, you know, it's, it's any decisions that we make must promote the common good while respecting human dignity. Uh, everyone must be treated as having equal dignity, worth, and value. And each person's value is, uh, is, is important. However, we need to take individual values and put them into that pot of the common good. The second principle was survival of communities. Any decisions that we take must be scientific, they must be evidence-based, and they must actually ensure that our communities survive. We looked at social solidarity, and this was the moral right to equal concern, requiring decisions made on vaccines and meaningful community engagement. And this we felt was important because this would uh, uh, allow for the promotion of legitimacy, trust and ownership of decisions that were made. And all four can actually be used to justify a vaccine mandate. So what are the relevant constitutional values? They're very much in line with uh, and even the, uh, the four principles that we put together are very much in line with public health ethical values. Uh, and the, these constitutional values are the right to bodily integrity, the right to freedom of religion, belief and opinion, the right to an environment that's not harmful to health and well-being, and the right not to be unfairly discriminated against the right to fair labor practice. And all these rights have to be balanced when we, take, uh, when we make decisions of this nature. And very, very, very importantly, what we always forget to look at is section 36 of the constitution, where rights may be limited in terms of the law of general application. So how do we now apply this to the, um, the mandate, the vaccine mandate. Before I actually move to how we apply it to that, I just want to state that the rights that I put up 
are, not, uh, are derogable rights. In other words, they can be limited. There are certain rights in our constitution that cannot be limited. I've listed them here. And for me, most important is human dignity, life equality. But you can see from this table that none of the rights that I reflected in the previous slide actually are on this table of non-derogable rights, so they can be limited. So how do we balance the arguments? So let's look at how we do the justice arguments when we're looking at limiting section 12 and section 15, that's bodily integrity and religious beliefs, opinion, etc. Importantly, we need to look at the importance of the purpose of the limitation, and that must outweigh the interests protected by the right, uh, protected by the right. And, and here we're looking at bodily integrity and religious beliefs. And we also need to make sure that if we limit any rights, it's the least restrictive means to achieve that purpose. So what we do is we, we use this to assist us working out whether the limitation is going to actually withstand constitutional muster and basically whether the limitation is justifiable. So what is the purpose of limiting? one's rights to bodily integrity and religious beliefs when it comes to making vaccine uh, vaccinations mandatory. So the purpose is of a public health good, a public health need, and that's to secure protection against death and severe disease. And we know that that is the situation. It's also to, uh, that, uh, sorry, we know that is the protection that we get from the, the two vaccines that are currently available in the country. It's to decrease onward transmission of the virus. It's to reduce the risk of ongoing mutations into variants of concern. And it's to relieve the pressure on our ICUs, our healthcare system, and our healthcare workers who have been working 18 months round the clock. And once the pressure on our healthcare workers are, is relieved, it will allow them to, to take care of non-COVID related issues as well. We can extend the purpose further to say that it is to secure the health of the nation. And what do I mean by the health of the nation? That's not only medical health, but it's economic health and social health as well. So would having a mandate, a vaccine mandate, be the least restrictive form or in terms of instituting a limitation? When we look at what we have had thus far, we've had physical distancing and we've had masks. And we've had other forms of non-pharmaceutical protections like hand washing, et cetera. These have been effective in curbing the transmission. But as you and I know, we've still ended up in several waves and we're expecting the fourth wave as well. And the only thing that can have a good enough effect to on, on the seriousness of the disease is the vaccination. And so, yes, the vaccination currently would be the least restrictive way forward if we're going to limit that right. Whenever a right is limited, not only do we look at whether you know, its purpose and how restrictive it is, but we also look to see whether that limitation is proportional. And that is whether it is, you know, it is proportional to the context. And what is the context? It's this relentless virus that's causing havoc. It's, it's this relentless virus that's really taken a toll on the health of the nation.
And therefore, that extent of infringement of the rights would actually not be out of proportion of the situation that we're trying to control. So let's look at some employment principles because this, uh, you know, the discussion started off with uh, mandatory vaccinations in certain workplaces. So we have three, uh, we have three uh, acts in the country to assist us. And when we look at the Occupational Health and Safety Act, this section eight and section nine of the act, which puts uh, 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 obligations on employers to take reasonable measures to ensure that the health and safety of its employees in this workplace is respected. And also it, it wants every employer whose workers actually interface with the public. It wants those employers to take reasonable measures to ensure that that interface doesn't endanger the health and safety of the members of the public. This is a situation we would find ourselves as healthcare workers uh, in terms of our interfacing with patients. Section 12 uh, of, of the Occupational Health and Safety Act um, further stresses that employers need to ensure that the work environment is not harmful to employees by protecting them from hazards emanating from the listed work, and that employers must, as far as reasonably practicable, prevent exposure of these uh, employees to these hazards, and where pre prevention is not reasonably practicable to minimize such exposure. Section 14 is specific to employees' obligations. And the Act puts an obligation on employees to take reasonable care for the health and safety of themselves and of other persons who may be affected by their acts or omissions. And it also further goes on to state that employees need to carry out any lawful order given to them and obey health and safety rules and procedures that are laid down by the employer or a person authorized by the employer to do so. And this would be in the interests of health and safety. Importantly, we look at section 38, which states it's a criminal offense for an employee not to comply with the rules. So the law is very clear in terms of whether we could have, we could go ahead with mandatory vaccinations in the workplace where it is required for operational reasons. So in June, uh, <coughs> there was a consolidated direction uh, that was put forward by the um, Minister of Labor, and this was gazetted, and it was on occupational health and safety measures in certain workplaces, and this direction was issued in terms of regulations made under the Disaster Management Act, and it, it looked specifically to Section 8 and 9 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Now, for us, the important section in this directive is section three, which stated that within 21 days of it coming into force, every employer needed to undertake a risk assessment. And in that risk assessment, among other things, it had to actually stipulate whether the employer intends making COVID-19 vaccination mandatory for its employees. So here, the law is using the term mandatory. And also it put an obligation on the employer to identify those employees who must be vaccinated. Because of the risk of transmission due to the nature of their work or because of their risk to contract COVID-19 because of their age and comorbidities. And of course, it said that employees must develop plans or amend existing plans to outline what measures are, need to be implemented uh, that would at the same time 
take into consideration the employee's rights to bodily integrity and freedom of religion, belief, and opinion. So this direction did not ignore that. It also stressed that whatever was done, there had to be mutual respect between employer and employees. Uh, and it, it went on further to say in section four that information raising awareness needed to be provided by the employer on the nature of the vaccines used in our country, the benefits that were associated with the vaccines, the contraindications and the nature and risk of any serious side effects. And they said, for example, severe allergic reactions. And just to say that the act in a foot, uh, sorry, this directive in a footnote uh, defined contraindication as, and what it said was con there was just one contraindication to taking the vaccine. And that was the, an allergy to the components of the vaccine or the vaccination itself. And of course, it put an onus on employers for administrative support. So there could be registration on the EVDS system and um, time off for employees to actually be vaccinated. Annex to C of this direction looked specifically at refusal of vaccination. And it stated that when an employee refuses to vaccinate, the employer needs to counsel the employee refer them for further medical evaluation should there be a medical contraindication. And if necessary, it needed to take steps to reasonably accommodate the employee in a position that did not require the employee to be vaccinated. So it could be an adjustment in the workplace situation or the work processes whereby the employee could work from home or in an isolated part of the workplace. Now that obviously will not uh, apply to us in the healthcare context. Of note, the direction does not address the consequences of refusal. And that's presumably because the employee can't be, uh, that can't be accommodated because he or she refuses, can have their services terminated on grounds of capacity but this can only happen provided proper processes and procedures are adhered to. So if uh, the employee, after processes and procedures are adhered to, still refuses to vaccinate, could this be unfair dismissal in terms of the Labor Relations Act? It permits dismissal for a fair reason related to an employee's conduct or capacity or the employer's operational requirements. So here we find that labor principles would assist as well. Could it be if you don't allow your employee onto the workplace, could it be unfair discrimination? You'd actually, uh, in terms of the Employment Equity Act, um, you'd have to, it, it, it states that Unfair discrimination uh, on various grounds isn't allowed. However, I think one would draw from the provisions of the Constitution to show that uh, the discrimination would be rational, not unfair, and otherwise justifiable. And when you actually look at this and you look at the need for mandatory vaccinations and not allowing those that haven't vaccinated onto the workplace, you can look at it as being no different from refusing an employee on the workplace because the employee is inebriated or has infections, contagious infections like chickenpox, measles, hepatitis, uh, because this would pose a risk within the workplace or within the immediate community. And when it comes to healthcare workers, as part of employment contracts, there's the need to ensure that the hepatitis vaccination has been taken. So that's employment. What about the general situation? And uh, does this actually, uh, you know, 
uh, can apply in terms of our patients as well. Uh, when we ask the question, can COVID uh, vaccines be mandatory in South Africa? Should our patients need to take the vaccine? And um, Safura Abdul Karim has made an argument that yes, uh, they can be, you know, COVID-19 vaccines can be made mandatory in South Africa. And, uh, and, and she's drawn on two laws for this. And this is the National Health Act, uh, and uh, from which emanates the regulations in terms of notifiable diseases. And we know that COVID-19 became a notifiable condition in 2020. And, uh, and then that's because it's a considerable public health risk. And therefore, she makes the argument that a healthcare work, uh, worker can administer the vaccine, even if a person refuses to accept it, but this will still have to go to court to be tested. Uh, the other law she drew from was the regulations in terms of this, the Disaster Regulations Act, uh, which kicked in in March. And, you know, what is stated is that under these regulations, a per person can potentially be compelled to be vaccinated, but it would still require a court order. So the courts would have to determine this. So what about outside the country? What's the situation there? So it seems like Italy led the race and already in March, they had made vaccinations mandatory for healthcare workers. And then we saw France and Greece coming through. And then we saw the White House in the United States uh, taking steps to vaccinate the unvaccinated. And then uh, when we look at up until the middle of September, uh, Reuters fact box, uh, actually highlighted the countries that had either COVID-19 mandates or the, uh, which uh, and required producing uh, evidence of a vex uh, of having received a vaccination or if there wasn't this evidence then evidence of a recent negative test and already we can see that by the middle of last month there were already 20 over 20 countries in this list that required either mandatory vaccinations or a negative COVID test. Looking at comparative law, uh, what could we actually compare our constitution with? I think we, we could I think we could comfortably compare it with the US Supreme Court because this is the most conservative constitutional court in a democratic world. And it has had mandates, vaccination mandates for over a hundred years already. It's made uh, rulings on this. Uh, and we know that a hundred year, over a hundred years ago, it, uh, it allowed for laws requiring vaccinations for smallpox and vaccination of children to enter public schools. And it uh, made the argument that it was constitutional on compelling public health grounds. And all 50 of the states in the US have established vaccination laws for public schools. And then of course, when the discussions around the need for COVID-19 vaccines becoming mandatory, uh, came to the fore uh, when there was the push from the anti-vaxxers uh, and uh, they started, uh, we started seeing lack of confidence in the vaccines and uh, people becoming very hesitant. We found that several states in the USA actually um, put out proclamations requiring mandatory vaccination. So what about common law and, uh, and whether you know, we have any comparisons in common law requiring ma uh, mandatory vaccinations? And we do have something already, and this is from Indiana University, 
that had put in a vaccine mandate at its medical school. And eight medical students then went to the uh, apex court to seek emergency relief against the university. And they claimed that the, uh, the mandate that the university had put in violated their constitutional rights to bodily integrity, autonomy, and medical choice. And uh, the judge there refused to block the university's requirement, so did not agree to actually take the students' demands further. And the judge stated that the constitution permits Indiana University to pursue a reasonable and due process of vaccination in the legitimate interests of public health for its students, faculty, and staff. And the judge went on further to say that health examinations and vaccinations against other diseases are common requirements of higher education. Vaccinations protect not only the vaccinated persons, but also those who come in contact with them. And at a university, close contact is inevitable. And uh, the 1905 Supreme Court decision on the smallpox vaccine mandate was actually cited. So I've brought up the issue of universities because many on this uh, webinar are either affiliated to universities or lecturing at universities, academics at universities, or linked to university hospitals. So it would be important for us to actually have an understanding of whether universities can actually require all members of staff and students coming onto its premises to be vaccinated. Could we go similar to the University of Indiana, in other words? Now, besides the general ethical and legal uh, arguments put forward, universities in South Africa have the power to make such a rule because they're governed by the Higher Education Act and they have their own individual institutional statutes. And both the Act and their statutes will confer power on a university council to govern the university and to make rules binding on its staff and students. And this is the legal source for the power to make a rule at the university. So what have we seen based on this is we've seen universities starting to move towards making vaccines mandatory. So uh, uh, late last month, we saw that the, U the UCT Senate voted to make the vaccines mandatory from next year, and it was an 86% positive vote. Stellenbosch has been considering it. Other universities have been considering it. And just this morning, WITS released its mandatory vaccination framework to staff for comment. So this is actually going that route as well. So yes, we are starting to move the route of vac uh, mandatory vaccinations, whether we want to or not. So how does the World Health Organization view this? It put out a policy brief in April where it stated that it does not currently support general mandates for COVID-19 vaccination. And it states that it's better to work on information campaigns and vaccine accessibility. However, it does also support mandates. And here I've pulled out some relevant aspects of the policy brief. And it states that mandatory vaccination can, you know, can be instituted only if it is necessary for and proportional to achievement of important public health goals, for example, and they say reducing onward transmission, contributing to wider protection of the community, protecting the most vulnerable and protecting the capacity of the acute health care system. It goes on to state that very, very importantly, one needs transparency. And in terms of decision making, it's got to be a stepwise decision making process. And this must be done by legitimate public health authorities. And it was, it's very important 
that all reasonable efforts must be made to engage with the different parties. Uh, so one could actually get them to understand the need for the, the mandate. So in terms of vaccine certificates, so if we don't have a vaccine certificate, we've heard that we may not be allowed to go to soccer matches. Uh, because when we look at vaccine mandates, how is the mandate implemented in certain spaces? It can only be uh, implemented if you have proof. And for proof, we have the vaccine certificate. It's called the vaccine passport. It's called the vaccine card as well. Uh, however, in South Africa, um, the department or the state has chosen to use the term vaccine certificate. So this is the term we would be using in the country going forward. So could it be unfair discrimination if one does not vaccinate and is therefore not allowed on, you know, within certain spaces. Section nine say, you know, of our constitution says there's a right not to be unfairly discriminated against. And I think we could make an argument that refusing someone onto premises uh, is rational, reasonable and justified. And it's, if we want to bring in the discrimination argument, we could talk about fair discrimination. Anyway, look what happened in 1905 going onwards. If you didn't carry your smallpox vaccine card, you paid a fine of $5. So with vaccine certificates, uh, we already saw, heard the government on media and saw various articles already from the 10th of September, stating that the government was going to introduce new digital COVID-19 certificates for the country. Uh, and our Minister of Health went on media explaining this. And then on the 30th of last month, so a few days ago, our president announced that the Department of Health was going to roll out the vaccine certificate as proof that re uh, residents in South Africa have been vaccinated against. Uh, and uh, going further, um, a few days ago, the, the website went up and, and people could start downloading these certificates. Uh, there seemed to be a few hitches, and then we got um, we got some notification to say, well, it's only going to go live tomorrow. However, some people were able to get their certificates already, and and already it's been implemented because the first two thousand, well, not the first two thousand, but two thousand vaccine certificate holders are going to be allowed free passes into the Bafana Bafana match next Tuesday. And so I saw, I tried to see whether I could get my certificate. And yes, I got it. And this is what it looks like. And I think I'm going to use it to get a free passage into the, the match on Tuesday. So on that note, I want to conclude by saying that it's so important to have a balance and that balance would need to consider individual rights versus the collective good. And when we look at uh, ethical principles of interdependence, interrelatedness, and the importance of Ubuntu principles and us existing for each other, I think we can make a positive argument for vaccine mandates and also for production of a vaccination certificate to enter certain spaces. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so, so much, Prof. Uh, I'd like uh, to introduce the, the members of the Sama Human Rights Law and Ethics Committee to say a few words and then we'll go into our Q&A. We've got quite a few questions that we need to address. 
So up first is Dr. Angelique Kutia, uh, the, the chairperson of SAMA and member of the um, uh, human um, HLRE, <laughs> the Rights Law and Ethics, uh, Dr. Mark Human, Prof. Stoffel Robler, and Dr. William Woskiesen. Was uh, who's the summer legal advisor, Prof. Robla is the psychiatrist and member of the summer HLRE, and also Dr. Mark Human is an orthopedic surgeon and chair of the summer HLRE. So I'd like to bring them uh, on so that we can have a word or two from, from them, and then we can go straight into the Q&A. We don't have much time left. Angelique? Thank you. I will be very brief and say thank you to Prof. Ames for a very informative meeting. And um, I hope that it makes sense what Prof. Ames tried to say tonight here. Um, I will give over to the Chair of the Human Rights Law and Ethics Committee, Dr. Mark Human. And uh, Mark, over to you. Thank you very much, Angelique. And thank you so much, Prof. Ames. Um, I don't think you could have laid out a more convincing argument um, if, uh, if the talk had been 10 times as long. It basically stated the ethical and legal reasons um, that behove all of us to support and communicate to all of our members, to all the doctors, to all of our patients and to all South Africans, why this is a good idea. I don't think anyone's ever tried to sell that vaccines are 100% safe. There is nothing on the planet that is 100% safe, not even a panada. But as far as comparison to having the infection, the, these are orders of magnitude more safe. And I think that that's the message we really need to get out to people. Um, I personally have never been a huge fan of coercion, but vaccine hesitancy comes with such an inherent danger to our population. Um, and, to our, and to our healthcare system and to our economy as a whole. Uh, I think that we are left with very little other option at the moment. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if any of my other panelists would like to say something. Um, Nalatandu, would you want to bring in the rest, please? Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I think Prof wants to say something, Prof Probla. Thank you, Lerat, and thank you, Prof. Uh, Ames, for a really informative um, presentation. Um, I was thinking while you were talking that um, I've been a psychiatrist now for 20 years and a doctor for about 30 years, but the science behind what we were taught at medical school regarding pandemics and vaccination has not really changed. And um, uh, all emotions aside, I'm still a scientist, so I would really like to start going to a restaurant to know that the other patrons have been vaccinated or go to a soccer match. I would really like to get my booster ASAP and, and um, I would really like to see our country survive and thrive. So as a fraternity, I really do believe that we need to come out with a very clear and strong stance um, aside from the, the emotions and you know, go back to our science and our ethics and our responsibility to the community that we serve. And, um, and that we uh, have a responsibility to secure the health of the nation, as Prof. Ames so, so rightfully said. So um, thank you very much. I, that, I suppose that's all I would like to say at this stage. Thanks, Prof. Thanks. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Wastesen wants to say a word or two. No, certainly. Just to thank everybody on this call and thank you, Prof. Dye, for so clearly setting out what is at stake here. Um, it, it raises complex legal and ethical questions, and I think that you've really explained it so, so well. Um, one hopes that it, it never has to come to that, that point where one has to force people to get vaccinated or use some of those legal mechanisms that are available. Um, one would hope that vaccine hesitancy can be approached with kindness and empathy and, and educate those that, that perhaps are still on the fence about it. Um, but unfortunately, a, a, a not insignificant number of patients and, and individuals out there will choose not to be vaccinated. And unfortunately, that's when nudges are, are gonna have to come into the picture. Um, and that includes um, vaccine certificates, and, and it is a, a balancing act of those rights, as you had quite rightly said. And, and we do believe that there is a compelling constitutional reason 
to to be in favor of of mandating vaccines and of course utilizing the vaccine certificate and i would also very much like to go and watch bafana bafana um in in the very near future so thanks so much prof diane thanks so much everyone thank you so much uh, i think there's there's a big question here around who takes responsibility i think uh, most people who are hesitant are worried about long term side effects of vaccines and i mean uh, on the on the q and a um, you know, chat here, I see people uh, saying, you know, they would be more comfortable, for example, if Sinovac was available because it's a technology that they feel, you know, comfortable with because it has been tried and tested, um, and they are saying they'll be more comfortable. So I think the big question is, who takes responsibility um, if a person then develops side effects to the vaccine? And I, I mean, Prof, I, I, could, I could pose that to you. So I think the most important is a proper informed consent. So, uh, so you know, when, when someone has a vaccination, uh, it's important to understand what the vac vaccine actually is and its components, its side effects. And also, one needs to look at the benefits as well. And when you look at the benefit risk analysis uh, and the benefits to you and the country, uh, you would then see the, the, the importance of taking that vaccine against the risks of the side effects. Who takes responsibility? Um, if these are side effects that end up, uh, that, that get uh, where you end up with long-term complications, they, you know, the, the program heads, that's the Department of Health, will need to take the responsibility for that. Uh, so, uh, you know, and there has been a compensation fund that has been set up or is in the process of being set up to compensate for issues that could arise as a result of the side effects. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. I think there's another big question around natural immunity, and I think we do need to speak about it. People are saying, you know, if I've been exposed to COVID, I've developed natural immunity, why do I still need to get vaccinated? So we don't know that natural immunity reigns as well. Um, and uh, according to the scientists, the protection from natural immunity is not the same as the protection from the vaccine. In addition, there isn't enough scientific evidence in terms of natural immunity. Remember, the vaccines, the evidence that we got from uh, on the vaccines are from well-controlled clinical trials. We do not have the sort of evidence when it comes to natural immunity. And currently the thought is that if you've had COVID-19, uh, sorry, if you've, yeah, if you've been infected by SARS-CoV-2, uh, you could have immunity that could last for about six months. Thank you so much, Prof. Very interesting that while you were presenting, you know, we were just uh, looking at a letter from uh, the South African Committee of Medical Deans actually advocating for compulsory vaccinations uh, for all health sciences students and healthcare workers. So it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, while you were talking, you know, uh, you know, a letter like this was also, you know, we were looking at it. I think the, the, the other problem, well, not problem, the other issue that people are raising on the, on the chat is around boosters. I think people are very eager, uh, specifically, I think the audience here is healthcare workers, people who had received their first J, &J dose much earlier in the year. They are just worried that, you know, they've not had any, uh, you know, um, feedback around when the, the booster trials will be starting in South Africa. I don't know if you've got any, any, <laughs> any news on this particular one. So what I'm going to say is 
that the vaccine map that Angelique and I sit on has prepared an advisory for boosters for healthcare workers. So that's gone in. It's been signed off and it's gone into the Minister of Health. So definitely that's on the cards. When it's going to happen, so that's the question mark. But just to say that all of us re realize and recognize the urgency of getting the booster process off the ground as well. But there definitely has been an advisory that's gone. Thank you, Prof. I have to read this one. It's a, it's a bit long, uh, but I just uh, thought it would be very interesting to just put it out there. So Anonymous says there are unknown, there are known unknowns from trials and unknown unknowns. The latter are due to rarity or short trials. These exist for both the COVID and the various vaccines. If one is 60, one does not need to consider unknown unknowns. If one is 16, one does. Um, Prof. Gray provided steps showing an unvaccinated healthcare worker has 49, I mean, 499 in 500 chance of surviving both at an individual and a species level. How can one then justify a 35 year old taking such a risk? There must be a perspective. Bubonic plague killed one in three. This is not plague. I see Mark is typing. Maybe Mark can, um, can respond live to this question. Thank you very much. Um, and and it's, it's not an easy question to answer. I think that the statistics are, are a, a varying playground. The, the, the statistics of 499 out of 500 survival suggests that the disease has a 0.2% fatality, and we all know that it's actually closer to 2%. So already that number is, is very wrong. I think you cannot underestimate the, the danger of this disease. If you think about all the implications, all the restrictions that we've, um, that we've instigated globally to try and cap the disease and then still look at how many fatalities we've had. So uh, I think that it, it comes down to, uh, uh, the best analogy is probably something like um, going into battle wearing armor. Um, if, you, if you don't have armor, you're that much more at risk. If you have multiple layers of armor, as in natural immunity, plus a vaccine, plus a booster, it's your bulletproof vest and your helmet. Um, and, and your chest protector. So you've got those multiple levels that, that, that come in and it just makes you that much safer for those around you and um, for yourself. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, Prof, once again, I mean, from, from the Ministerial Advisory Committee side, regarding Sinovac, uh, I think, um, you know, well, the Coronavac uh, vaccine, um, there's, there are questions uh, around uh, when will that be available? I don't know if you, you could shed some light on that one. No, I, uh, I can't help you with that. Uh, but uh, I can say that SAPRA has approved the Sinovac. Yes. Angelique, you need to help me there. SAPRA has approved the Sinovac. Yes, it has received conditional approval. <laughs> But it's really uh, now around when it would be included yeah, in the So one needs to look at the operational requirements of the program as well. And, and what would it, what would the impact of having several different types of vaccines on the program mean? Uh, and currently, just having the two vaccine uh, seems to work. Uh, introducing the Sinovac, there's going to be a shorter interval between the two vaccinations. So one needs to look at this as well. So that will depend on the National Department of Health. So all we do is we prepare advisories, but in terms of implementing and instituting the rollout and making the final decisions, that's the National Department of Health together with other state players. Okay. If, I can just, um, if I can come in here, Nolo. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Prof. Ames is correct. Um, as um, we, we do make the advice and they have looked extensively at the four vaccines, it's the Pfizer, the Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, 
and then the Sinopharm vaccine. And um, we do have studies in South Africa on the AstraZeneca, the um, Johnson & Johnson and the Pfizer. And um, as far as I know, we don't really have adult st studies done in South Africa on the Sinopharm, um, but it has been approved uh, on a rolling um, advice um, from uh, the SAPRA. Thanks. Yes. Yes. Is Sinovac, not Sinopharm. It's it's Sinovac, yes, it is Sinovac. It's the yeah. Corona uh, yeah. Not the not the Sinopharm. Yeah. Sorry, my, my mistake. Yeah, Coronavac. So um, you know, people. Uh, I think uh, we've gone through uh, most of the questions, and I think the themes. Uh, you know, we've tried to to group most of what uh, people were saying. But I have to read this one because I think it's the best. It's do or die. And Prof, they are using your surname. It's do or die. Hooray for the summer stance. <laughs> so on that, on that note, let's allow our participants to fill in the poll uh, so that you can get some feedback. Thank you so much, Prof, for a very insightful pre presentation. And thank you to the, to the summer um, you know, colleagues. Uh, yeah, we will uh, then allow people to fill in the poll. Thank you so much and have a good night.